Hello again. Uh, we're going to try something a little different with this video. I I have different things that I'd like to mention. I have a bunch of things I'd like to mention, but the, a lot of it's for another day. And uh, and the, I just have some notes. I have things that, to read to you, and I will throw some clips in where they fit afterward. And uh, I just want to talk to you today about... Uh, you probably have seen in the news all of all the different recalls and then i'm sure you've seen this uh the bird flu i'm sure and uh and i just want to talk to you about some different things that i've looked at over the years on the food recalls back in 2018 one of my first videos actually was covering this the salmonella and everything and it was called be afraid of your food and I do still say you should be afraid of your food but for different reasons than they're suggesting and uh, so I I'll throw that video in here maybe right now have you noticed how scary food is getting it seems like every day anymore I see another recall for another contamination I mean, what could be going on? What could be causing all of these outbreaks? Seriously, salmonella, salmonella, salmonella. It's everywhere. Even those backyard chickens who were supposed to be for a healthier food, they say they're giving people salmonella too. What exactly is in that filling? Apparently salmonella. You know, these could all be legitimate news stories. I'm not saying they're not. I mean, with the, the food machine that is the food industry of the United States, at least. And who knows what you're eating. So over and over, I see these stories about salmonella outbreaks. And they're even saying that salmonella may have aided the destruction of the Aztec Empire. So I get this message of be afraid, be afraid of your food. That's what I hear them saying to us. And I'm telling you, be afraid of your food. It is not the same food that you once ate, and you need to understand that. I've written about it, and I've made a video about it. And really the feedback that I've gotten from people on this information is that they had no idea that things were this bad. So, be informed. Take a look. Oh yeah, and one other thing. It doesn't necessarily have to just be the lead up to make you feel so much better when you get your clean, humane, sustainable foods that they have ready to serve you. But scientists are also working on a salmonella vaccine. We're saved! <laughs> We all need to move our food a little closer to home. Find someone local. Find local farmers, people that you can meet and visit their farms and work with them to get your food. You don't need this packaged garbage. You don't need their vaccines to protect you from toxic food. And you certainly do not need their synthetic biology fake franken food but my my point in all that is that they all of these unsafe foods all of these oh we got e coli oh we have salmonella oh all of this it just justifies this this science based food the tech based food food replacement products, sorry, that it justifies changing everything to save us from this sick and dirty situation. And I'm not going to tell you that I don't think uh, farming, like the animal, the, the terrible animal operations that are running, I'm, I, I don't think that those are good. I don't think that's the way to go. I think the people need to know their farmer and I've said that for years and it's possible I know mine so and I, I know I I've it's not everybody can not if some people are in really big cities and it's harder but but there's 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 things that we everybody can do to try to get away from 
this whole, like, I mean, why it, you, the foods that you're buying, if you weren't buying these things from these just mega corporations, multinational, like behemoths, if you, if you weren't buying from them, then it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a problem when you see, oh, salmonella on Oreos or whatever. I don't even know if Oreos was this time. I know it's last time. Anyway, so let's talk about that. I'm rambling already. Let's talk about, you may remember I, uh, I've showed this company before called Chromec and they were working with DARPA and they wanted to be like sampling the air all the time. They put, during COVID times, they put their machines in the UK. They put them in, I think, a school and they were talking about them in airports, but they want to be constantly sampling the air. And then the machine will tell you, red alert, red alert, there's there's a new pathogen or there's this identified scary bad pathogen. Well, they're not the only ones doing this. There's other companies. Let's see, where's I have I have all these things printed out in front of me and I have a book, two books actually. Um but there's this other company that in 2020 was big for they were collaborating with Airbus and it's called Conaku and they the, what these, what all these companies are, because there's other companies too, but all of these, they're, they're talking about e-noses, electronic noses, and they're, there's different ways. Like this Conoco, they're saying they're using genetically modified living cells. There's another one that's using something based off insect antennas. There's another one that's just like carbon nanotubes. There's so many kinds. There's an Israeli company called Sensify that, uh, they, they actually, Side note already on Sensify, when I was looking, the spelling is different by one letter from this other Sensify that I'll, I'll put it on the screen that they, they, they replace all these different big bad thickeners and smootheners and all these things in your food. I'm doing air quotes in your food that, uh, they say their, their product, you can replace all those carrageen and all these baddies. And you can replace it with all you got to put on the label is oat fiber. It's clean and it's, it's oat fibers for a nice clean label. So, but anyway, yeah. So these companies, they're using these e-noses, electronic noses, and they're not just talking about this stuff for food and quality control and that, but they're talking about like rapid non-invasive di diagnosis for diseases. Like they're saying they're going to be able to sniff out cancer. They're going to be able to treat you for cancer before you even know you have any kind of thing going on with cancer. They'll tell you you have cancer, but they, science is ready to cure you. So don't worry. And they say that these e-noses are good for a sustainable farm and environmental and wellness monitoring. They, uh, they, they want to help with everything. And, uh, on the, the bird flu side of things, they were the one company, there's a, yeah, Sensify was talking about that. They were also talking to meat and dairy manufacturers as well. So one of these, one of these companies in particular talks about how they're, they're doing the, it's like sensing as a service and, they're all talking about sensing as a service, but they were talking about that. Oh, the little gizmos that you can put in your manufacturing facility or whatever, they're going to be really inexpensive and it'll just be like, uh, having the AI scan all the time. That'll be a, a, a subscription sort of thing so that they can keep you safer and have that nice revenue stream to these companies that it, like I've said in other videos, so I talked about Chromec, it's going to say what they want it to say. And, I think I've showed, I think I know that Jeff and I showed for quite a while, the uh, whole, uh, they're attacking the food system. They want to change everything. And all of these recalls, all of the scare with the food, it all, it justifies the investment in the technology foods. It justifies, uh, moving away from these unsafe practices. Oh, farming outside, E. coli, people not washing their hands when they're picking your lettuce and, and cows and all oh, the bird flu. Like it, it's just, it justifies it. And also it's like, I watch, I watch this one guy on YouTube. Sometimes it's adventures with Dano and Dano. He's always trying to help people find the deals at the grocery store. I watch it cause I, I'm interested in the prices at the grocery store cause it's, it's just crazy what it's crazy how the food 
prices have just exploded. And Dano is talking about how uh, people should stock up because people should because, I mean, you don't know. You don't know when the next 2020 is going to happen and the rug's going to get yanked out and you're not going to be able to go to the store. You're not going to be able to, everything online will be all sold out, ordered. I mean, who knows? Who knows when it's going to happen? But uh, I think it's going to happen. But who knows when? And, but Dan was always telling people to stock up, stock up. And I totally agree. But then he's also telling people about all the recalls. And I, f- I feel so bad for these people, the stress with this, uh, not maybe not being aware maybe he's aware maybe not being aware of what uh like the overarching agenda 21 agenda 2030 this transformation of our world and everything they can get their grubby little paws on we know i've showed we know that uh they want to reinvent all the life on the planet and they are they are releasing this stuff and we're all participating like the, it's just so crazy. The synthetic biology based everything like the enzymes. Can I avoid these enzymes? Because that's what they're like companies like Ginkgo, Ginkgo Bioworks. They're all, it's, it's the, it is the non GMO way to change things, tweak things, make everything work for this new science food is this enzymes. Anyway, it's like you're washing your laundry and you're, you're putting it in your water supply. Everybody is participating. You're, if you're just using all the things, and I mean, how do we avoid it? It's a, it's makes things harder to have to avoid all the, all the things that they're doing. And we didn't do it, but we're just we're experiencing it, right? So anyway, and I will say on ginkgo, another side note, and then maybe I'll go back to where I was before. But uh, on ginkgo, I was watching. I've seen so many of their presentations, and I never, I never heard this reference this way until uh this one video I'll throw a clip up but this one video where uh, like the it just brought to mind the eat the bugs you know eat the bugs here's the clip so using a non-gmo approach that's throwing caps enable rapid strain optimization using classical methods only so how does the technology work INCAPS is a high, it's a ultra high throughput screening technology that can screen millions and millions of strains all at once. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with biological ND, you might be thinking, well, sure, I could put some bugs through a fax machine and screen all those variants in high throughput. But let's say that your biological product is a live microbe that is secreting your natural ingredient. You need a strain that hyperproduces this molecule to bring your cogs down, and facts alone wouldn't give you much information uh, to characterize rates of excretion, for example, or growth condition, or grow your bugs in uh, interesting fermentation conditions. And then, so she's she's calling these little symbio factories, these little life, this if it is life, this cre- these creations of theirs and their machines, and they're it's your bugs, your bugs. And I mean, the whole, like, we go to look the soil and greenest people, you know, I see they're feeding, feeding all the, they'll feed it all to the microbes and the microbes will make the, the soil and green and they'll eat the wastewater and, uh, all the nasty things. They can feed them the garbage. Oh, and on the garbage, uh, where's that paper on the garbage? The, uh, I've got it here. Um, What's one of the industries that's leading the charge, they say, on takes the lead is waste management. And we already covered what I was talking about, Soil and Green, in other videos. Who owns the majority share or a huge share in both of the biggest waste management companies in the United States? Bill Gates, of course. Shocker, shocker. Anyway, so yeah. All right. Justifies the science food, all of this stuff. And they're putting these little sniffers everywhere and they're cheap. And all of these food manufacturers, like they, they say, and all these papers I've been looking at over years here, they're saying how this is cheap and it's easy and it's fast. People used to have to wait. Companies used to have to wait so long to get the tests back to make sure whether or not their food is safe. And, and now this is like same day. Same day. And look at it's like every day there's a recall. Of course, every day there was a recall in 2018 when I was did that video, which I mean, it's not like that's new, but it's definitely 
huge. It made me a bigger scale than then. And then with the whole destruction of all of these like animal facilities and everything, it's, uh, it's really, it's crazy. It's scary. It's, it's, uh, it's just so big. It's like, what are people going to eat? And if they're afraid of this stuff they've already stocked up on, like, I just wonder how it's going to go. And on the E noses, and I'm sorry, this is so scattered. I wonder if I'll even put this up, but I, I just, I have so many things to cover and I'm having a real hard time getting the time to ducks in a row, get everything all pretty and polished to talk to you about it. I just, I really want to tell you these things and wait, what about this one? I really want to tell you. <laughs> so that's why I'm being such a, a little, uh, scattered, but yeah, they they E, the E noses there. They talk about how they can sense chemical signatures. They can get exact, uh, exact, like they're looking for this precise thing or an unknown thing and, and they can identify it and they'll alert you. It makes me think of the mechanical hound in Fahrenheit 451. It's, I know I saw an older movie of Fahrenheit 451 and they didn't have the mechanical hound. Read the book. It's not a very long book and it's, it's a pretty important one reread it if it's been a while, maybe. Um, but the mechanical hound could sense you out by your, your chemical makeup, by your signature. And they had all of the firemen's signatures on, <laughs> on file in the firehouse and the sampling, the sampling of the world and the mechanical hound will be able to find you. And oh my gosh, the one company, Sensify, is it Sensify that did? No, it wasn't Sensify. It was Conico. Conico has put their thing on a mechanical hound. I'm like, oh my gosh, sorry. It's just, it's so, uh, like fiction becoming the reality, which is the, the case in so many things, which obviously like they have to put these things in our minds so that they can even be a thing. Like the, we call it predictive programming, Richard Clark, like I've showed with, uh, that breakpoint book, that guy, that I don't know what his job was. He works for, he worked for all the presidents and he's like big military. He's guy that, uh, said we were going to have a cyber nine 11. Anyway, he talks about it as first occurrence syndrome. Cause they say that, or he says that when the thing that you say is going to happen, it's never happened before. People don't, won't accept it. But if they, if they've had it seeded in their brain, then they, they can more readily accept it when it's been, engineered or when it's been put out there in the world. Also, we talk about in the book warnings, I talk about first occurrence syndrome. When the thing that you are saying is about to happen has never happened before. If it happens, it's the first occurrence. People tend to disbelieve it. They only know what they've seen, what's in their experience. So if you say there's going to be a major terrorist attack in the United States, yeah, there was Oklahoma City, but that was a couple of crazy Christians, Americans. You say there are going to be a bunch of crazy Muslims come here and do something inside the United States from outside. They don't believe you because that's not in their experience. Intellectually, it makes no sense because we all know that things are constantly occurring for the first time. And if you say to someone, isn't life about things occurring for the first time? Isn't history a list of things that occurred for the first time? They all say yes. But when you actually sit them down and say, look, this thing is going to happen, in the back of their minds, they're thinking, eh, it never happened before. Okay, what else did I want? To oh, yeah. So we got the mechanical hound. We've got them sniffing everything out. And I'm not saying all this food is safe. In fact, some of this, a lot of these things that I see being recalled, I would not suggest you eat. But I also, I don't want you to starve. I don't want people to starve. And I, I mean, so if that's what you eat and if that's what you have, then I just don't want you to be terrified of your food because like these, the, the, that Dano guy, he's like, he wants people to wash everything and everything. And it's cause it's scary. It's scary. They push the fear of it all. And they tell you how bad these diseases can be. This salmonella it sounds really uncomfortable. And, uh, I just don't, I don't think that we should be as afraid of the food for that reason. But I mean, that's just my personal opinion. I think we should be afraid of it because, they're changing it all and, and they have been changing it all. You're already eating it. We're already eating it. And, uh, they want to make it all that they want to make everything this tech based, uh, food replacement stuff. Anyhow, 
they say science will win. That's what they've been telling us. Science will win. And uh, at least they said it a lot before. I don't know how much they're talking about it right now. But I just wanted to tell you real quick a couple more things before that's all I'm going to do um, today in this video. Uh, I wanted to to read to you some little blips from this book that I have kind of on the whole science will win topic. It's called Famine by Rhonda Bloomberg. It's just this little book. It's from, looks like 1978. Anyway, the first quote, or the first thing as you get into the book is uh, a, it's a quote by this scientist, Norman Borlaug. And it, it's, there will be no coming together of minds until a major famine brings people together. And uh, I do think they're they're making that famine come at us. And who's Norman Borlaug? Okay, listen to this bit. It's kind of long. Okay. And this is on, like, we're the way we're going right now is to trust the science. And science is going to produce, like, all... Science in the machine is going to produce all the food and all the medicine and all the everything. Um... Using their words, I don't think I'd call it those things, but. If it's not safe, it's not food. I cannot express it food safety more simply. When I think of food safety, I see it as an amazing opportunity to leverage science and technology towards an application that can really make a difference to people in pets. All right, so listen. This is on page 50. Uh, the Green Revolution was hailed as the answer to the global food problem. Breeding new varieties of seeds that brought in larger harvests seemed to have unlimited possibilities. If scientists could continue creating new hardy crops, then the poorest countries might be able to grow enough food for their own people. But the Green Revolution started to look sickly yellow after 1973. The new seeds had to be fed large quantities of fertilizer, pesticides, and water. And when the price of fuel and fertilizers and pesticides went up, miracle crops drooped. The Green Revolution needed money most farmers didn't have. They couldn't afford to pay for the fuel that irrigation pumps required or the tractors and chemicals needed for big harvests. The miracle crops were best suited to big business agriculture, agribusiness. To make matters worse, when the far big farms flooded the market with enormous quantities of grains, its price went down. As a result, many farmers were unable to eke out a living from their small plots of land. They sold their farms to big companies. Big farms benefited, small ones suffered. The Green Revolution left some people worse off than before. Dr. Norman Borlaug, that guy that I quoted before, the leading scientist of the Green Revolution, declared that governments were just going to have to distribute seeds, fertilizer, and pesticides free of charge. Water pumps would have to be installed and irrigation channels built for all. If we can't get the Green Revolution to the little guy, there is no revolution, he said. I know, this kind of goes on and on, but I'm getting getting more to the point. <laughs> uh, researchers are developing new seeds that need less fertilizer, fewer pesticides, and less water. In 1975, three new strains of grain were developed. New, improved seeds resistant to most pests and diseases are being distributed at low prices to small farmers. And then it talks about more land. Even if farmlands succeed in growing bigger and better crops, there may not be enough good land left on earth for growing more food. About 3.6 billion acres of the earth are cultivated. Some claim there isn't much more land left suitable for crops. Others insist that at least 6.6 .6 billion more acres could be planted. So now here, here we go. This is what I was, this is the big part I was mentioning. This is science. This is science re suggesting this. The search for new lands has resulted in proposed projects that sound impossible and improbable. Scientists have been eyeing jungles, which all I can think of is like, oh, the destruction of the jungles for food production and deserts and frozen wastelands. Hmm. 
Uh, dense growths, drenching rains, and blistering heat have ruled out jungle farming in the past. However, bulldozers could clear jungles, build terraces for holding soil, and dig irrigation channels to regulate the amount of water fed to plants. Fertilizers could be applied to enrich soils lacking minerals that have been washed away by driving rainfall. In this way, vast areas could be farmed in the Amazon basin of Brazil and the Mekong Delta of Vietnam and Cambodia. Then they go into Africa and all this stuff. Anyway, I'm sorry. That was kind of long for the point. I, I'm talking about Borlaug being the, being the, the leader of the Green Revolution. And then they're talking about taking over. Well, we can use the jungle. We can use the, we can use the frozen wastelands. Yeah. Cause they said on the next page, frozen wastelands could disappear within 21st cent or with 21st century advances. Scattering coal dust could be used to melt snow. And by using giant heaters and super strong lights, icy areas of our planet could become green fields. And like I, uh, I showed in my video, if you haven't watched it, please do, uh, the, uh, what's really going on with Arctic sea ice. Um, they are, I mean, like they're saying here, like they've been, they've been trying to destroy the ice and it's like, they're telling Greta and her friends are telling you, they want to save this. They want to save the, the, the ice caps. And it's like, no, they don't. They've been actively trying to destroy them. And, uh, they're just talking about it again here. And with the desert farming there, they, they reference Israel and all this, they, oh boy, they do their science food is something there. And they share, don't forget the California Israel partnership. I probably have that video still and I could throw it up. It's a talk from the Milken Institute years ago. I'll put uh, at least it, it up on the screen, maybe a clip of it and I'll link to it. Going to move right into just uh, talking about the, uh, what happened in this memorandum of understanding. It was sounded, signed in Mountain View in March of 2014 uh, by the prime minister and governor Brown. I'll, I will link to all these things that I'm looking at. Um, there'll be, you can find a link below to find all those. Anyway, uh, they also talk in this book, you know how they're, they, they're just experimenting with, uh, the seeding clouds and, and, uh, weather modification. Oh, it's just an experiment. Bull crap. Anyway, they talk in this book from the seventies about rain making, seeding certain types of clouds with chemicals. This is another expensive way of producing water, but tampering with weather has brought storms of, of protest. In 1973, when Rhodesia seeded clouds, the poorer adjacent nations accused it of stealing rain from them. In 1977, Idaho accused the state of Washington of cloud rustling, declaring that by seeding clouds, it was grabbing rain that could have drifted to Idaho. Anyway, that was just a extra point. I just want to read one other last little bit from this book. Um, food from factories. Modern day alchemists are transforming crude oil, waste rubber, newspapers, garbage, sewage, and weeds into food. Factories are changing petroleum into a protein called SCP or single cell protein. It is being used to feed livestock, but further refinements may bring oil-based food straight to the dinner table. They love us. SCP needs neither soil nor sunshine. It is grown and harvested indoor on indoors on waxes made from oil. A twenty or a two hundred and fifty acre factory could make as much protein as a million acres of soybeans. FPC fish protein concentrate is a flour made from whole fish, including scales, bones, and guts. It is sold and in many cases given free to poor people who use it for making breads, thickening soups and stews and making desserts. Grasses and weeds have also been made into acceptable dishes after the parts that cannot be digested are removed. Formulas in liquid and powder form are being mass produced by big corporations and shipped to poor countries. They are high calorie protein rich food supplements. Government and relief agencies distribute them to the poor. They may cure the high death rates among preschool children. In many poor countries, one child in five dies before reaching the fifth birthday because of diseases caused by protein deficiency. Even rich countries are using factory-made foods. Inflation has forced people to acquire a taste for imitation meats. Supermarkets sell fake bacon, beef, pork, and turkey. These quote-unquote meats are made from soya beans that machine spins machines spin and shape into chops, roasts, and hamburgers. Makes me think of the shearing and spinning and shearing process. Was that what it's called? I think that was in the 
uh, Dear Vegans video. Have you watched that? I'll, I'll link to that too. Maybe I'll throw it on the screen. Uh, where was I? Oh yeah. Rubbish, garbage, and sewage are being used to make animal feed, which then you eat the animals. When chemically treated, they grow algae, the same nourishing plants found in plankton. At the American General Electric Company, cow manure treated with bacteria turns into a mass that is dried into a powder with a high protein content. Food from waste materials are only for animals and the, the bugs. Uh, they're only for animals. Grain, instead of being used for cows and pigs, could then be available for the world's hungry people. Farm plants make up the bulk of the world's food diet. Factory foods are an expensive, tasteless substitute for the products from land and sea. Meanwhile, babies are coming faster than bread can be baked. Because that overpopulation, well, they're, oh, they're telling us now how everybody's population is dropping. Anyway, but they still need to make the sci-fi food, right? Because of the everything being dangerous, everything's unsafe. I mean, shoot, they had that uh, whole, like... They can't, we can't have food as it was. We can't have food as it is with these, like, humans involved and, and, uh, farms and whatnot. Or that there was a thing in Pennsylvania recently that had, uh, mystery notes. Oh, and these big food packaging companies, there were notes showing up in children's cereal. People were on the news. The one clip they used over and over again was this, this guy saying, it's in things targeting children so it makes him worried that's not exactly what he said maybe i'll put the clip up but uh but yeah i mean it just bothers me that i mean the note really it's not the note that really bothers me is just what was it's uh, these notes are found inside food like kids kids food and since that initial report we have heard from dozens of people from across northeastern and central pennsylvania and beyond this map shows where notes have been found in a wide variety of food products, as well as other products like beauty supplies. The notes have also been found pinned to trees at state parks all across the Commonwealth. All of these notes are similar in that they contain a variety of words referencing current and past world events, pop culture, business, and conspiracy theories. The I-Team is working several leads as to the origin of the notes and who might be responsible for putting those notes in those products. That is a work in progress. Stay tuned. It's There's just so many things that it seems like, to me, with what I've looked at, that they're trying to push us away from the real food stuff you could grow in your garden or you could buy from Farmer Bob and, uh, and to push us to something that is only safely processed by machines and uh, keeps the dirty humans that will put notes and who knows what in your, your food, sealed in your food. And, um, and they will, they'll be sniffing everything. They'll be sampling the air. They, it's not going to be just in these uh, airports and schools and, and the, the food manufacturing companies that, <laughs> the mechanical hound will be able to find everybody anywhere because they, and anything they, they say they are finding because remember like Peter Diamandis likes to tell us all the time, we're about to be entering a world where we are surrounded by trillions of sensors. We already have so many sensors around us. There's so many just in your phone. There's, there's sensors everywhere. And like, they're going to be able to, they're going to be sniffing. They're going to be sniffing. It's one of these technologies. I don't doubt it at all. That's everything. I mean, I'm seeing it and it, it's crazy, but take care. Thank you. I'll be back again.